interesting there's several places out in East Texas and as far as I know I don't think anybody's ever tried to do music um, on a song through teleconferencing within a classroom <laughs> so this is going to be a first and might be the last uh, you know how time delays can go so we don't know what's going to happen but uh, this basically starts the second half of our Scholar of Aging program uh, the first half uh, we, we dealt with many topics that were very uh, along the lines of clinical education and uh, this is moving towards more of a gerontology uh, section of the course and I thought just to kick it off just to get our minds into that mode and, and thinking about terms of spirituality and, and aging or just life in general I, I, I have a song that I like to play uh, to a dancer by Jackson Brown it, it includes many things in terms of uh, love and life, loss, uh, things that are gained uh, a lot on how we look at dancing in terms of something that might be in sync uh, but many times may not be and it just gets us thinking about uh, lots of different things uh, in the terms of a metaphor of a dance and uh, not that I'm a great dancer by any means but uh, <coughs> I hope you enjoy this and then we're gonna have Michelle Serapina come up and I'll also give a little introduction that's required for our CE credits so just sit back enjoy your lunch and this will just take about two or three minutes. Keep a fire burning in your eyes. Pay attention to the open sky. You'll never know what will be coming down. I don't remember the track of you. You're always down. Thank you. 
It's all downhill from there. So, spirituality of aging, mind, body, and spirit is today's topic. And um, I'd like to also acknowledge our partnership with the East Texas AHEC. Um, they have helped immensely in us getting this program together, and they help us as coordinators in our remote sites as well. Uh, this, and everyone has a, uh, a handout, and should be able to follow along if you need. Okay, and uh, we have an agenda in terms of what we'll try to follow, and it's you know, roughly loose, and we'll um, do the best we can with following that. Next month, we're going to start looking at special populations, uh, including older minorities and rural elderly, especially those in the East Texas area. Okay, and that's going to be in January 14th. Uh, like I said, that this lecture uh, covers a, a wide variety of topics. Uh, we're here, and this section here will be covering, like I had said, uh, more of a gerontology slant to the information. Uh, if you want more information about our program, the Scholar of Aging program, you can visit our website. Uh, it tells you all about our activities and the things that we're trying to do there. Um, this, we also, each month, do several types of activities for the Scholar of Aging program. It's a pretty large, involved program. It's 160 hours. And uh, there are modules that we will have online, some PowerPoint presentations, and also some other things to look at. So uh, this lecture is only one of the activities that we're going to have available in December. We have, uh, we're up to six teleconferencing sites. Uh, it's been growing um, all the time. And I'd like to welcome our newest site, Tyler Community Hospital in Woodville. And uh, th they've just recently uh, gotten in contact with us a couple weeks ago. And uh, there's at least uh, three or four nurses that I know uh, that were, that are uh, joining in. Uh, another feature besides the teleconferencing is that we're offering lots of CE credits. Uh, for example, uh, uh, C CME, uh, Continuing Medical Education for um, ph physicians, DOs, um, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. Uh, we're uh, offering 2.75 hours per, uh, for this session. Uh, the, the thing about this is that it's looked at one activity, meaning that um, you won't get the credits for this until at the end of the program, which is in May 2005. But there are uh, basically just filling out uh, evaluation forms that are located on the desk if you want to obtain those CME credits. And it looks something like that. Okay, Just get those uh, uh, after the sessions. Uh, fill this out. Give it back to me or Beth. Or you could just take it with you and email it to me or uh, fax it. Um, one more information on CME, you can contact the Office of Commu Continuing Education. Uh, we're also offering CNE credits for um, uh, registered nur nurses and LVNs. Uh, this again has a registration, uh, I'm sorry, an evaluation form that goes with it. And the packet looks like this. If you'd like to obtain 3.2 contact hours for uh, continuing your nursing education. Unlike the CME, you have to be here for the full session to obtain the 3.2 hours. Okay. We have CEUs for social workers, uh, 0.3 hours. Okay, so there is an evaluation form for that as well. And also a separate sign-in sheet for social workers located on the table. Okay. And finally, CEUs for uh, uh, th uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists. And again, uh, that main thing is to fill out the uh, uh, general evaluation form that I'd like everybody to fill out, regardless if you want CE credits. Here, this is for our program, very important for our reporting to HRSA, who is funding this uh, grant as well. Okay, any questions on CE uh, credits in terms of what to do? Uh, most of it is pretty straightforward. Okay, let's get on with the good stuff. Oh, I need to also say that our, uh, none of our speakers today, uh, Michelle Serpina or Dr. Victor Serpina, have any commercial affiliations to disclose. Okay. Um, Michelle Serpina, I'd like to thank her for doing this today. She's going to be talking about, about enhanced longevity, <laughs> touching the spirit of aging. Uh, many of you know her through her work uh, as founding director of the Academy of Lifelong Learning. Uh, she's worked closely with Galveston elders and community organizations to create a program of college level courses for those 55 and over. Uh, this program has grown uh, in the past several years. She's also been affiliated with UTMB since 1996, where she began her work developing and managing preventive medicine residency programs. She's worked in graduate medical education, uh, continuing med medical education, and for the Institute of Medical Humanities, 
where she is an adjunct faculty member. Uh, she speaks nationally and has published peer review articles and book chapters on topics of gerontology and spirituality. She earned her uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Cincinnati in uh, sociology and psychology and a master's degree in human services administration with a concentration of gerontology and adult daycare. Uh, she's currently uh, working on completing doctoral studies <coughs> in gerontology, exploring the relationship of creativity, reminiscence, and spirituality. And I think without further ado, you've heard enough of me. Let's have Michelle. Okay. Thank you for being here. Um, and, and for those who aren't here, for being there and joining us. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Tony. What a wonderful song. Touch the Spirit. That's what we're here for today, Touching the Spirit. Uh, we started with our learning objectives because we all need to do that for all of those CEs that he was talking about before. We're going to define spirituality as a definition. It's not the only one, but it's one we're going to work from today. We're going to identify some key practices that could enhance spirituality and also some practical resources, uh, part of which will uh, appear in your annotated bibliography, which was um, attached to the handout. When I refer to the handout, um, I, I'm assuming that everybody got the book chapter that was uh, Spirituality in Healthcare. And that's from this book called um, Integrative Medicine. Um, is, is, that some, is that something people, yes, have? I'm sorry, what? The chapter, the book chapter. It was a handout. Okay, so if you didn't get it, it's available, but if you, if you did get it, this is the book it's from. It's called Integrative Medicine. Uh, those of you who have done book chapters for others know that I have no uh, financial reimbursement <laughs> associated with that. But it does uh, kind of cover some of these points, and so that's why we wanted to share it with you. I, I therefore will not cover everything that's in that chapter today. Um, so we are also going to talk about some pieces of an annotated bibliography that was attached with that that is not part of the book chapter. This pr uh, program today is about mind, body, and spirit, and the body part of it and the mind-body aspect will be covered when Dr. Serpina arrives later on. So we're mostly going to talk about the elements of touching the spirit of the relationship of wellness and wholeness of the people that you interact with every day in relationship to how that spirit has an impact in their overall wellness. Wherever you are, wherever you're from, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever tradition guides your way, there comes a time when we all need to be touched through the heart. And that's what we're here basically to talk about today, that touching space, that touching through the heart. And we just had an example of it. We've all had the experience of being touched by Tony's wonderful song. And the message in the song came to us in a way that wouldn't have occurred perhaps in other ways of see it, simply seeing it written down or maybe just hearing it spoken. So. We can be touched through the heart. Our spirits can be touched in many ways. And with a population that we work with, um, there are some unique ways that that happens and some other ways have fallen away for some, some people. Spirituality for today is going to be defined as a soulful quest, a path, or a journey. And in the poem that I just read you by Sam Keen, when he says, whatever spiritual path guides your way, I almost wish he had said, whatever spiritual paths, because for most of us, there are many things that come together to create what we define as the path or pathways that we see toward our spirituality. Spirituality is a soulful quest, a path, or maybe pathways, or a journey. Oh, how do I go backwards, Tony? Okay. Spirituality, as contrasted to religion, which we're going to talk about in a minute, 
is internal and interpersonal as we're defining it today. It is an inherent aspect of every human being that relates to the absolute, whatever we might call that. It's that domain where values and meaning exist. Religion, on the other hand, is as defined as more external, interpersonal. It's usually a body of beliefs and practices that are defined by a community or a society to which its ad adherents mutually subscribe. Those are the definitions from our chapter, so the, those are, that's where we came up with those. S people can be religious and spiritual both. People can be religious and not so spiritual. People can be very spiritual and not so religious. And our goal today is not to place labels on people's pathways or to differentiate so much as to clarify when we talk about things like spirituality that we aren't talking about religion specifically. And yet, religion for many people is a spiritual pathway. It isn't the only one. And for many people, um, religion plays a varying role in that, in that pathway. There are three questions that help to get to this place of what is seen as touching the spirit. What helps you get through tough times? Who do you turn to when you need support? And what meaning does this experience have for you? Whatever the experience, it can be a negative experience, it can be a positive experience. But those three questions kind of get to the heart of, or the core of, where people are finding their spirit, touching their spirit. As Sam Keen said, being touched through the heart. These questions were developed by Carol Kinney, Carolyn Kinney in our nursing school here, and um, are a part of our training for nurses and physicians and others in our spirituality and healthcare curriculum. Uh, one, of the, one of the creators of which is here in the room with us today. We're so glad to see you. Thank you for being here. And this, que this series of questions, as you can see, doesn't talk about religious church attendance. It doesn't talk about specifically directing the idea toward some interpersonal or external belief system, it really leaves open the ability of the person to direct the answers for themselves. So what gets you through tough times for some person may be prayer. It may be calling up my pastor or a trusted uh, religious friend, but it also may be going quietly aside and reading a spiritual book that touches that person's heart. And so these three questions direct the thinking toward those core issues of touching the heart or touching the soul or touching the spirit of the person, but they don't direct the person's answer toward religiosity. And that's kind of the distinction we want to, we want to keep separate today. And again, I acknowledge Carol and Kenny for developing those <coughs> and for developing them and creating them in such a way that they are broad enough that they can really be useful to people across the board, across the spectrum, regardless of the religiosity of the patient. Spiritual practices and support come in many directions. They can come from a faith community, and for many people they do that. They can <coughs> come through prayer, meditation, self-reflection, they can come from the family. And one of our learners in the academy said recently, but I don't have a family. And I reminded him that we all have the family of humankind. And we do, you know, because especially as we deal with seniors, with mature adults, family members sometimes do pass away. And sometimes there is one family member left and that's a time when this relationship, the family of humankind, can especially feel like family to us. Spirituality and community can come from friends and caregivers, from support groups. 
external and internal sources of strength. We um, accumulate our own set of resources, both external and internal, for strength and inspiration. And sometimes as um, healthcare providers, we're there as a sort of resource when people lose sight of those things and we can simply ask those three questions that I put on the screen before. Where do you turn? Where do you turn? And that helps the person remember where they turn. We're not imposing on them our way of turning for sources of strength and support. We're just gently encouraging them to turn to those places that have worked for them. The paths to touching the spirit can be many. They can be all of those things that are customarily thought of as spiritual or religious, but they can also be creativity. They can be fun. <laughs> I'm saying this as uh, our, uh, our, uh, my co-presenter walks in wearing Rudolph, um, <laughs> Rudolph horns, and that, uh, that's a wonderful reminder of how our lives can be filled with fun and spontaneity. I wish I could tell you that he's been waiting out in the hall all this time for that moment. And on cue, he walked in so that we could all laugh. But doesn't it feel good? It felt good before when we were singing, when we heard Tony singing. It feels good to have laughter. And so we have paths to touching the spirit that have to do with all of those issues of conventional spirituality and religiosity, but we also have many other ways to touch our spirit. Creativity, fun, social activities, volunteerism, and giving back. It's amazing how many people just get renewed by being able to give back, delivering meals on wheels, reading to somebody who can't read for themselves anymore. The list is very long. And for some, you may have read this in uh, one of the recent uh, national publications, experiencing nature is defined as the primary path to spirituality. Um, a study was done by one of the major poll takers in our country, and they ask a lot of people, what do you consider your spiritual outlet? And of course, all the routine things came up, you know, my church, my synagogue, my mosque, my, my, my books that I read that are, you know, the spiritual traditions of my faith. Uh, a, a very high percentage of the respondents in the study who were men said that their way of touching the spiritual path in their lives was to go out and experience nature. So experiencing nature, all of these things are ways that People can touch the spirit and meet the definition that we presented before about what spirituality can really be. Um, we aren't going to present a lot of the data today, but the annotated bibliography that you received and also the chapter, the book chapter that we passed out to you, has some references for you. So if you're interested to follow up on this, or if you need more information on this, there's some really wonderful resources out there. The first is, uh, the first listed, not the best, the first listed is by um, Dr. Dan Benor. He has done a book called Spiritual Healing, Scientific Validation of the Healing Revolution. And this is a really wonderful uh, compilation that reports a lot of findings in one place. He has subsequently come out with a second edition of this book. Um, lots of research done by uh, Dave Matthew, Matthews Larson. Uh, the Faith Factor, this is an annotated bibliography of clinical research on spiritual subjects. There are four volumes to this, and it's an amazing compilation of a lot of research. It's not all the research that I, that's out there, but if you need to go to a spot that has it all in one place, this four volume set is absolutely wonderful. Okay, so the research is out of the way. We're going to talk about creativity, fun, and social activities. And um, 
one of the things that can can make that happen is to touch the spirit with certain mind-body approaches. We have so many resources on our campus. We are blessed that we have places where people can go to experience firsthand some mind-body approaches to personal wellness and touching their spirit through these um, avenues. Deep breathing, meditation, we have yoga classes, Tai Chi and many other similar classes available for our um, geriatrics patients here at UTMB. And uh, later on, we're going to talk about some more ideas that you all can suggest along those lines as well. Creativity improves health. And we know that. We have discovered um, that there is great benefit to people participating in cognitive and social activities. Work was done with a group of sedentary people. These are people who couldn't really do physical exercise. They couldn't go to the gym. They couldn't do weight bearing, resistance training. So um, they did social and creative activities. And the result was that all causes of mortality were decreased as much as those who did physical activity. So there's great benefit. And this was a study done by uh, Tom Glass. It was a population-based study of social and productive activities as predictors of survival among elderly Americans. That was in uh, the uh, British Medical Journal just a few years ago. So it's, uh, it's good data. Uh, the New England Journal, not to be outdone, in 2003, uh, came, uh, came out with a very wonderful study called Leisure Activities and the Risk of Dementia in the Elderly, done by Joe Verghese and a long list of colleagues at the Albert Einstein Center in New York, the Albert Einstein Center on Aging. And what they found was that increased participation in cognitive activities at baseline was associated with reduced rates of decline in memory. That's good news. Even better news is that this was one hour a week. One hour a week. Now, in the Academy for Lifelong Learning, uh, learners participate in two hours in each class every week and some of them sign up for three or four a couple of people are in five classes so they're just they're stored up for years to come no it doesn't work that way I don't want to mislead you but um, this is good news and so this is news that we can really help our patients understand that if they have opportunities for participation in cognitive activities this can be really a benefit to their health and those activities abound in our communities. And if they can't do them in community, then they can get a crossword puzzle book, or they can play Scrabble. All of those kinds of cognitive activities fit in this criteria for Giese's work. We all know late life creatives. So this is the moment when I'd like to ask for all of you to come up with some ideas and I don't know how we do that with it. can we do that with the remote groups or is that too complex okay. so I'd like to I'd like to ask you two questions and the first question is who is a late life creative that you know of and it doesn't have to be that you know personally it can be that you know of Pablo Picasso most of us don't know personally but we know him as a late life creative. Grandma Moses was another late life creative. But it can also be your neighbor down the street who does beautiful oil paintings or crochets, baby bonnets for um, homeless children or whatever it is. So I'd like us to talk about what are late, who are late life creatives and what is their creativity. So really let yourself think in a wide ranging way here who do you know who's a late life creative, a role model of late life creativity, and and how does that creativity <coughs> express itself? Yes. I was always impressed that Julia Child started her career at age 50 and had this productive, like, 40-year career. Uh, and I love to cook, so she was my role. Julia Child at age 50, and she had a long career after that, and her creativity was cooking. This is a wonderful way to define creativity. And, and that particular kind of creativity almost always involves community. You, you cook for someone. And even if they don't come and eat with you, 
you maybe give it to them. She cooked for the world. She cooked for the world, and people received the, the joy of her experience. So cooking is a great way of creativity. And, and, and in later years, think of the grandmothers and the aunts and the people who have the recipe, and when they're gone, the recipe is going to be gone. So that's an especially creative endeavor because like a, a, like a famous oil painting, some person's recipe is their unique signature. That's a great example. What are some other examples? Grandma Moses and Juneteenth. Grandma Moses was a great painter and she started when she was mm, no, very old. Yes, very old. A good, good example. Yes. Yeah, Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, uh -huh. he was designing buildings into his 90s, I believe. Yes, and they just kept getting better, better and better. It was wonderful, yes. He, Frank Lloyd Wright, she just mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and when we mentioned Grandma Moses, I just want to go back to that for one minute because um, the definition of creativity is something new added to the world that has value. And, and that's a definition that we get from Dr. Jean Cohen. Something new added to the world that has value. And the reason I bring up Grandma Moses is because her painting was in the primitive American style. And so for some people who admired only the Baroque or the, the Cubist or some other style of painting, to them, her approach to painting might not have been uh, considered their standard of creativity. But for Grandma Moses fans, her work had great value. So her late life creativity definitely fit the definition. And it was unique, and it was kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. And she just, she kept painting those pictures. She didn't really care. They sold, made millions of dollars for her. She had the expression of creativity. Great example, and great example with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, one of my favorite people, as a matter of fact. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. I, I was thinking my hero, uh, John Glenn. John Glenn. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And his, his form of creativity is this wonderful uh, ability to fly airplanes at very high speeds, spinning around in ways that most of us wouldn't think of doing in our 20s, much less at age 77. Was that how old he was when he flew? Yeah. Great example, great example. And so creativity, when we think of creativity and when we think of encouraging, touching the spirit of our patients through creativity, think big. Think as big as John Glenn out in outer space. Think of creativity expressing in a, a variety of ways. We have two, two people back here, so eat, one, of, one of you go and then the next. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. you know, he has evolved so many times in mm -hmm. life that yes. doesn't have a touch of humanity. So uh, Jimmy Carter gave back. This was volunteerism that he did, but it's also creative. What he did that was creative was to empower so many others to join in this process of giving back and raised a lot of money in, in the time being, and also left behind this wonderful legacy of homes for people who otherwise wouldn't have had them. That's a wonderful example. OK, now. So, uh, she was saying about cooking, and my aunt died at 96. Mm -hmm. And even maybe six months before that, she really kept cooking for mm -hmm. the time. And I read an article. Oh, God, this is a long time ago. I was still studying gerontology in the 90, late 80s, I think. And uh, there was a study done at UC Berkeley of successfully aging women. Mm -hmm. And they controlled their kitchen up until the later age. Mm -hmm. And they were successfully <coughs> successful aging. That's a great example. I, I, can I hear this? Can the, the remote locations? This is, a, this is an example of a 96-year-old aunt who up to her, near her death, she was still in control of her kitchen. She was still expressing her creativity in her kitchen. And this is borne out by a study at UC Berkeley that said that women 
who age creatively are the ones who maintain that control in their kitchen. And imagine the organizational skills we were talking before about the value of cognitive activity. Imagine the organizational skills and the cognitive uh, exercise that comes with planning, shopping, organizing. That's a, that's a wonderful, holistic way of being creative. Thanks for the example. Reverend Helen. Oh, I was thinking of Rosa Parks, uh -huh. who um, continued to teach. Uh, she may still be alive. Mm -hmm. She is. Mm -hmm. uh, teaching young people to <coughs> To discover their place in the world and their voice in the world, right? And what a what a wonderful uh, way she has kept so youthful and so dynamic by continuing to be uh, yes. this uh, this voice of justice. Yes, that's another good point. That being touched through the heart, that touching the spirit process, shows from the outside, and so. Uh, uh, Rosa Parks is a wonderful example of that. Great. So might have to like see, you know, address them. Okay, so I can tell you who we have. Uh, okay, so we have we have some examples here from our Galveston site, and I'm inviting anybody from the other locations. Anybody, uh, anybody out there want to give us uh, a suggestion or an idea from your side? Um, Someone you can think of who expresses creativity in their mature years? Well, I don't think you give anyone famous or anything like that. I was thinking of more along the lines. My grandfather, after he, reti after he retired, started taking art classes. That's a great... Tell me who you are. Introduce yourself, please. Sorry, this is Kelly in Nacogdoches uh, at SFA. Kelly. From Nacogdoches at SFA? Yeah. They're behind one of the other people. Okay. Okay, Kelly, thank you for thank you for your comment. And I love your comment because you're absolutely right. It doesn't have to be anybody famous. Because the real the real goal for us is every person we interact with every day and how we can encourage that kind of touching the spirit, their creativity. And so your grandfather, in his late mature years, ended up taking art class. And those are the kinds of things that really can bring out the creativity that people may not have even expressed before that. He may not have been an artist in his earlier years. Anybody else out there? Hi, Peter. <coughs> Peter. Hello. Hello. Yes. He's right there. Do I have the audience? You have the microphone, Peter. Hello. Hello, Peter. Go ahead. Yes. I want to say that most people I've observed have some kind of creativity. I've observed people like my relatives, friends, so on and so forth. They are not famous, like Terry has said. Uh, but they will do things like uh, visiting with family, mm -hmm. having family members come by, talking, laughing, enjoying life. And I think that's creativity, and I've seen them do well. So it seems everybody has that potential to be creative. That's beautiful. Oh, yes. Everybody has the potential to be creative. And what Peter said was that his family, they come together, they laugh. They socialize, they care for one another, and that's an expression of creativity at its truest form. And that is what goes back to Sam Keen's poem, touching straight to the heart. And that meets our suggestion and definition of spirituality as being something that is a pathway to the spirit. And that gathering of family, sharing of love, laughter, jokes, fun, happiness, that's creativity. So these are great examples. Thank you so much. And I think I heard a female voice that was about to speak before Peter spoke. 
Somebody else out there? Hi, this is Linda from Tyler. Can you hear me? Yes, Linda from Tyler. Hello. Hello. Yes, Linda from Tyler. Yes. Uh, we have a whole list here. Uh, let me look. Arthur uh, Rubenstein, any, any number of Supreme Court justices, and our favorite, our most creative person was Strom Thurmond, who fathered a child at what, age 90? <laughs> <laughs> I could tell by the laughter in all the other remote locations that you heard Linda's comment. Linda said that they made a whole long list and her favorite or their favorite was Strom Thurmond whose creative endeavor at age 90 was to create a child. And so uh, yes, uh, those are all great ideas. It's true. There are, there are so many ways of being creative. Thank you all for participating and joining in with the discussion and getting the feel within your own sort of paradigm of how this creative urge can just express in so many ways. And I loved it when Peter said, isn't it something we all can do? Everybody has that potential. Sometimes some people forget that. And sometimes people don't have the opportunities sort of presented to them in ways that they recognize. And so that may be the way that the healthcare provider can step in and say, have you thought of this in your life? Could this work for you? Would this be something that would interest you? Do you know that these resources exist out there for you? And so um, that's why I wanted to get us all engaged in the dialogue here, because it gives us an opportunity to really think about how we can translate what we're talking about here today to patients that we're going to work with Monday morning. OK. Uh, yeah, if it's OK with you. OK, thanks to everybody for all of the ideas. Um, we are going till 1.20 or 1.10? One ten. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we're just going to talk a little bit about some ideas about this creativity component. And uh, Schlachter Shalomi said that time is stretchable, not linear. We can reframe it, we can reshape it, we can repair past events and relationships. And that's sometimes the most creative work of touching the spirit in the mature later years. And so some of the ways that we can do that is through story writing and sharing. We have a program here at UTMB that offers the opportunity for people to be together and share their stories, write them down, read them aloud to one another. But people don't have to be in that kind of setting to do it. They can share their stories with their family members without going into a group. And that can be a very sacred practice. Uh, J Jamie Pennebaker, who was in Texas for many, many years and may be known by some of you in this room, who now is in California, did a piece of research called Forming a Story, The Health Benefits of Narrative. And he found that people who wrote their stories for even 15 minutes at a time had improved health outcomes. Similar work was done by Joshua Smythe, whose study was Effects of Writing About Stressful Experiences on Symptom Reduction in Patients with Asthma or Rheumatoid Arthritis. These folks also wrote for merely 15 minutes a day. They had an assignment, though. They could only write about stressful situations. The control group was writing grocery lists or something, just anything. <laughs> but these folks had to be writing about stressful experiences. Asthma and rheumatoid arthritis, the two diseases that can be very um, frustrating in care, those two diseases were selected had symptom reduction in the group that wrote about stressful experiences. This process reclaims experience of the past and gives meaning sometimes to seemingly unrelated life events. It allows the storyteller to speak, to be heard, and to be acknowledged by others. And I think probably Peter was also touching on that when he spoke about the families getting together and when that community is together, the acknowledgement by others who love you, that what you have to say matters. There's also a program 
that is storytelling for those with dementia. And I'm going to really ask you to stretch your definition of creativity and imagine, is it true people with dementia can be creative? And the answer is yes. There's a project called Time Slips, which was developed by a colleague in um, Milwaukee who created groups of uh, patients with dementia, Alzheimer's, and other dementias. They sit together, they have a, a picture, and they make a story about the picture. They don't remember anything. They don't have to remember anything. They're making up a totally new story. And after 10 weeks of gathering together like that in this story group, their stories are compiled into a book. And then there's a celebration. Their families come and get to see the book that they have authored, that their creativity has developed. And so um, we all have the ability to be creative. And, and I think it was Peter who said that. We have to know that creativity is something all of us can do, even patients with dementia. And so the Time Slips Project has generated hundreds, probably by now, thousands of stories. There's a, an off-Broadway play about it and art exhibits. It's, more importantly though, rekindled hope for the human connection among people who are struggling with Alzheimer's and related dementias. You have the handout with uh, Dr. Basting's contact information. Um, Doug Hammerschold said, for all that has been, for all that has been, give thanks. George Valent's work on the longitudinal study at Harvard found that um, gratitude is an important indicator of successful aging. Gratitude and forgiveness, two components. Um, there is a tradition, my husband and I were just uh, in Kauai where we did a similar presentation to this one and we learned from one of the uh, participants that there is a Hawaiian tradition that says um, at the end of every day, forgive. And there is an a old Jewish tradition that says to begin each day with gratitude, listing a list of 105 things for which one is grateful. In that way, we learn that you could almost let gratitude fill your life. So one thing you can do is um, ask yourself, ask your uh, care provider, um, uh, what are you thankful for? Maybe three things, maybe not 105, maybe three. And the other side of that is forgiving. Life Review, says Spanheim, is a scanning and a reclaiming of the past. It derives from a felt need for forgiving. Forgiving does not mean condoning. That's very important for people to understand. You can forgive fully without excusing. If I could forgive only one thing in my life, what might it be? And that's a question that you can add to the three questions that you asked before. Sometimes issues around forgiveness can really be barriers to wholeness and to touching that spiritual side. So what can we do? Um, we can write a letter. It can be a letter of forgiveness to someone else, or it can be a letter of forgiveness to yourself. It can be a letter of gratitude to someone who's alive or someone who's no longer alive. In our writing groups, people frequently write letters to third grade teachers or college professors saying, thank you, you changed my life and I didn't tell you then, or maybe I didn't know then. Um, and you can write a letter just to yourself or maybe write in a journal. That's a wonderful way of working through that spiritual touching, that touch to the heart that Sam Keen was talking about. We um, provided you an annotated bibliography, and so if you want to follow up on some of these topics and don't really know exactly where to turn, there are notations uh, uh, after each listing that give you a little bit of information about the resource. Two questions that can be useful to you in looking at this whole idea of touching the spirit, and that is, what is the elder, what is the person already doing to enhance their spiritual practice? It might be interesting to learn that. They may be doing some wonderful, exciting, interesting things that we can learn from. But the second question is, what new options might they want to begin to explore? Like uh, the grandfather 
who took an art class in his 90s, or the grandmother, who's or the aunt who's still cooking and maybe wants to explore a new method of cooking that she hasn't tried before. So those are, those are kinds of news you can use, kinds of ways you can say, how, so how, how do I put this into practice? And so that might be, you know, that might be a way to say, what kinds of creative things might really work for your patient? Um, you can get a hold of me at my UTMB address. And now it's time for questions, comments. Do you have any of the time such pictures? No, I don't. No, I don't. Yeah, the time slips pictures are uh, what Victor's talking about is the um, stories for the storytelling groups for patients with Alzheimer's um, are photographs that are whimsical, so that um, if they're too real or authentic looking, people may get engaged in trying to remember what they mean. So an example of one of the pictures would be a woman who's sitting in a cart, little single person cart, and it's drawn by an ostrich. And she's in front of a house, and half of the house is like a fun house. You know, it's the wall is all sideways. And so when you present this picture to this group of um, patients with dementia, you say, so tell us about this picture. And so they tell all sorts of stories about um, why the house has wiggly walls, or why the lady is in a cart being pulled by an ostrich, and where she's going. And interestingly, um, we did an uh, exercise in a group of ministers, social workers, physicians, and nursing personnel at a creativity and spirituality retreat in California last summer. And as an exercise, we used that picture and asked them to make up a story. And after they made up their story, I read them the story that the group from Libby's Place had told about the same picture. And it was remarkable that they told so many of the same things which were not hinted at in the picture. For instance, in both stories, the one told by the Libby's Place folks and the one told by the spiritually oriented healthcare professionals, in both instances, the woman was in the cart riding away from her husband because he had been mean to her and she didn't want to be with him anymore. So uh, it's very interesting how, uh, as, uh, as Peter said, we all have that creativity within us and it, it just comes out in ways uh, it it's, uh, comes out in ways that we can't imagine. Yes? Michelle, I wanted to comment on the definition of spirituality. We <laughs> have, you described it as an inherent aspect of every human being, mm -hmm. some connection with the absolute. And recently, oh, maybe in October, Time Magazine had an article about the God gene. Uh -huh. And there's always this delicate dance for us. There's this delicate dance for us to want to have data and research and maybe a gene mm -hmm. that yeah. is... Um, that gives us something in the world today, but something that's so mysterious. And, and you know, we have to dance back and forth between that hard data and the yeah. mystery. And uh, I think that creative tension in between those two places is really uh, special. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That, that's, that's a great comment. Uh, it is true. It is true that, uh, especially I think the media loves to, loves to kind of focus on those kinds of issues because they, they, um, they invite interchange. They invite uh, sometimes controversial interchange, but they invite interchange. And one of the things that um, it is in our chapter is that there are lots of issues around this whole component of where can spirituality be a part of healthcare, and where are the boundaries and who can be in those boundaries and who steps outside of those boundaries. And so uh, at one, in one place in the chapter we talk about the controversy of these folks see it this way and some other folks have this point of view and there are some very interesting dichotomies there. And then in another place there's a, a table or a, a box that says, but at least we can agree on some certain points. And so, you know, it is that dynamic tension that always says in our evidence-based medical milieu, 
we have certain standards and expectations and we like to be able to pinpoint the gene or the, the mechanism, the mechanism. And we, we, can't, we can't answer all those questions yet. Yeah, thank you. Thank I you I might add to that particular concept uh, that's said a different way by a person who's pretty much an existential theologian who says that we are all spiritual beings yes. having a human experience. Yes. That we're yes. all spiritual beings, which, you know, yes. which sort of corroborates the gene theory. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. But, but it, it sort of gives you a baseline uh, from that one perspective that all right. beings are spiritual, uh, even though we're just pure human. Yeah. And we, we, because we are human, but of a spiritual nature, yeah. that's why, as Sam Keen said, we all have that longing to be touched to the heart. Yeah. Um, I thank you very much. Yes, there might be some more. <laughs> more questions out in the out in the realm. I, I had a question actually. I was okay. um, there are a lot of health care professionals in different disciplines here, and I'm looking at this also as bridging uh, some of the things that we've talked about previously. And so one one topic more or less goes into <laughs> another, and you know spirituality is you know. And, and the feeling of uh, their beliefs mm -hmm. plays a huge role, I think, sure. in, in seeking health care and obtaining the right kind of health care and, 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 and maybe interacting with health care mm -hmm. professionals. Yeah. Uh, how does that maybe all kind of work together, positive and negative? Yeah. Um, That's a, a really good question, Tony. How, how, how does that fit? How does it fit that people really um, fundamentally, we believe that everybody has a spiritual longing. So maybe it's a spiritual gene, or maybe it's, as uh, Tehard says, maybe it's that we are spiritual beings, in fact, having a, a physical experience or a human experience. Um, and I think we talk about that in the chapter in terms of the kind of controversies of what are the boundaries and what are the guidelines specifically that healthcare workers can turn to to be accepting and open and encouraging of the individual spiritual pathway, whatever it may be, and it may be very different than the healthcare providers. On the other hand, to uh, know that for some people, that process of seeking healthcare, as you said, is intrinsically bound with those beliefs. And so uh, we, we start this chapter that you have in your hands saying that from long ago, most health care was provided by the spiritual guides, the wise people, the wise elders often, people who had a special calling. And so it's, again, very common for us to have the tradition that health care and the spiritual side can walk hand in hand. And that's where the controversy comes up for some people of how, how hand in hand can it walk and whose hand should it be. So, uh, and, and so we do, we do look at that in the chapter uh, in a little more depth. Yeah, and we're going to talk about this actually next month because I think it also comes under the umbrella more or less of cultural competency. Mm -hmm. Yes, because absolutely. You absolutely, well, so absolutely. There's a wonderful book that speaks directly to that issue. It is not anywhere listed in, in any of these uh, handouts. Um, it's called Spirit Catches Me and I Fall Down. And it's the story of a Hmong family who came to the U.S. and whose child was treated in all the conventional allopathic ways. And, and the entire book is written about the, um, the way that the spiritual beliefs of the family, the cultural beliefs of the family, continue to hit up against our allopathic medical standards. And so uh, that's a great example of culture, the, the importance of cultural competence and understanding and openness to listening first to what the patient's views are. Yes? I think, you know, as you were asking your question, uh, Tony, the important thing really is to know our patients. Yeah. And knowing our patients, perhaps, uh, and I'm thinking about, say, very depressed patients, uh -huh. and uh, knowing them, knowing the family, 
and how that depressed person who had been liked before, as a little boy say, maybe he liked bird watching, and maybe he's not doing that anymore. That could be a creative thing that you could do now, you know, with family's help. So I think if you know our patients, then you can be helpful. Right. That's a great that's a great point. And that's why I sort of ended with those two questions that said, what are they already doing? And maybe they were already doing bird watching and what can they do now? And maybe that's something you can say, Oh, well he enjoyed that in the past. But if you don't know, if you don't know the patient, then you don't have that advantage. And so you're right, it's absolutely critical to get to know them, to get to know people. Yes. I was just gonna add that um, Dr. Serapina and I here at Bender will teach this wonderful course called Spirituality and Healthcare to uh, first year medical students and nursing students. And we really start at the beginning saying that this is uh, client centered or patient centered, that uh, we go to the patients and, and to follow through that we, we really must know the patients. Yes. And, and to assess their spiritual needs. Yes. Yes. Uh, Kate, Dr. Shandor is here with us. Uh, Dr. Serpina is going to be speaking in Harold Vanderpool. The three of them developed a program at the University of Texas Medical Branch where nursing students and medical students sit together, learn the same information, break into small groups, and work through ideas around these topics. And what Kay is telling us is that the, the, the core view, the basic premise that everyone accepts when they go into the program is this is all about being patient-centered, about the patient's view of their spirituality, n not something external to that. Yeah. Okay. Just, are there any other yeah, more. on the other sites? Any uh, discussion? Anybody has something they'd like to add or ask a question? Now's your time. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your comments.